Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ron. I'm an alcoholic. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, driving down Bluefield Avenue, I was reminded of my um, youth. I grew up in Cedar Grove, which is right over the hill here. Um, how many people here are like from Montclair, like love, lived in Montclair all their life? Just a couple? Um, then I won't bother with some of the stories I know. <laughs> um, but I could tell you that in the late 60s, uh, we had a lot of fun uh, coming over here to Montclair. And uh, a lot of my great experiences were, were over here. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is because Chris has asked me to be part of this workshop, and I've known Chris for the entire length of my sobriety, which I'll share with you in just a minute. And then uh, walking in tonight, I was able to see Bill, who I've also known for that entire period. I'm um, delighted to really be here and be a part of this kind of workshop. Um, I've actually done it with Chris on a number of occasions where we've spent weekends together going through this kind of a workshop in a condensed period over a course of a weekend. Um, with actually both Chris and or Bill. Um, so I've, I've done this before, and I'm, I'm familiar with what Chris is trying to accomplish here. Um, I think what I want to do tonight is three things. I want to tell you a little bit about myself and uh, what my experience has been in working the steps as a whole so that you can get some sense of what my experience has been in terms of my spiritual awakening as a result of working these steps. Kind of a brief qualification. The second thing I want to do is share with you some very things that, some things that are very specific about the fourth step um, for those of you who may not have actually had that experience yet. But just because it's, it helps me, so if you could just help me. How many of you have actually done a really thorough fourth step that includes four-column inventory resentment of resentments and those kind of things? Okay. Okay, a lot of experience out there. That's very good. So um, it works very well with what I want to do tonight, which is not to spend a lot of time on um, all of the mechanics. I'm not going to walk through forms or specify, you know, where you put something in the fourth column and so forth. But I am going to talk about the general orientation of the fourth step and what my experience is in, in working with sponsees as we go through the fourth step. And then the last thing I want to do is talk to you a little bit about what my experience was in doing a fourth step myself what it was like to get to that fourth column of a resentment inventory myself and share with you some of the specific examples that were on my inventory and what it was like to start with a resentment and end with some responsibility in the fourth column. So to begin with, in terms of my, my sobriety, in terms of, of uh, a brief way of qualifying, uh, I came in here about 12 years ago. I'm going to be celebrating 12 years this year, this coming year. And I came in here... Um, into the rooms, not because I was really done in, in my mind or because I really felt that, that it was uh, something I was looking forward to, all right? I was kind of beaten into submission. My oldest son was in um, rehab. He was in Carrier uh, for a drug problem and had been in some quite a bit of trouble. And so he was at, at Carrier, and I had begun to attend parent um, you know, visitations there and parent meetings with Carrier uh, with groups of like 50 people who were alcoholics and drug addicts and their parents and spouses and so forth. And, um, you know, I guess the short story is after about the third time I went, you know, all the counselors, like I could, I could feel them looking at me, you know. And I don't know what my son was telling them, but it wasn't good, okay. And, um, you know, and I got so scared. I know this is going to sound like I made it up, but I swear this is true. I was so scared and so intimidated by like the third or fourth time. The way you go, you're supposed to do this way, like, you know, uh, you'll say, like, my son said, my name's Eric, I'm an alcoholic, and somebody, Mary, I'm an alcoholic. And then the spouses and the significant others would introduce themselves as, I'm Ron, I'm a parent. Or my, my wife would say, I'm Donna, I'm, I'm a mother. Or somebody would say, I'm Judy, I'm a sister. About the fourth time I went there, we're doing the introductions, and I could feel the uh, counselors looking at me, and I'm just like sweating, you know? And uh, they came around to me, and I said, I'm Ron, I'm an alcoholic, you know? And uh, the counselor goes, no, not, not, not yet you're not, but maybe, uh, <laughs> but maybe you're right, you know? And I'm like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so the result of that was uh, my son was living at home and continuing outpatient at Carrier, and he relapsed. Actually, relapsed a couple of times. And I, I, we're supposed to have all the alcohol out of the house. 
And uh, we did, but I was continuing to drink, and I was drinking into blackouts. And I really was, there were some really bad blackouts. I couldn't remember exactly what happened, and supposedly I wasn't drinking, and my son's relapsing, and the counselors are trying to figure out what the, what the dynamics of our household are like, you know. Meanwhile, my daughter was doing hard drugs, and she's in therapy, and that's another story I'll tell you about in a minute. So my son's trying to stay sober in that environment, and... Um, they call us all down, the family down, for a meeting. And, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, that's a good idea because he's relapsed a couple of times. And we've got to straighten him out. And uh, so we get there, and they talk to him for, like, 15 seconds. And then they all look at me. <laughs> and they go, now let's talk about you. And I'm like, well, you know. And the counselor, one counselor got up, and she came across. It was like a circle. She came across, and she stood right in front of me. And she said, um, she said, I know you, you know, in that sort of assertive way. And I'm thinking, like, F you, you know. And she says, no, I know you. And I said, well, what do you mean? Because I'm going to have it out with her, you know. And she says, uh, I know what you're thinking right now. Because um, what they had suggested was if the household couldn't become a more secure environment, that they were going to take my son out of the house and put him in a halfway house or some kind of safe environment. So I knew that was in the background. So she said, you know what you're thinking right now? You're thinking that the best thing that could come out of this situation is that we would take your son out of your house, which would remove the problem from you, and then we would stop bothering you. He'd be out of your life, and you could keep drinking. That's what you're thinking. And that's exactly what I was thinking. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was thinking, I need to keep drinking. Take my son. I mean, I, I know it sounds horrible to come out of my mouth, but that's what I was thinking, and she knew it. Because if they took him, then he'd be someplace else where they'd be watching him. And they wouldn't be phoning my house, checking up on me, and asking me if I'd been drinking. Maybe they'd leave me alone. So when she repeated that back to me, it sounded the way it probably sounded to you. <laughs> All right? And I'm thinking, wow, how did I get here to the point where you know, my son has ceased to become the most important thing to me. My drinking has. And it was like really getting kicked in the stomach. I was almost like ill, violently ill, you know. So they wanted to, anybody who's seen an intervention on TV, you know how it goes, right? So they wanted to take me away to rehab straight from the room. And I said things like, well, I don't have my luggage with me. Oh, we could take care of that, you know. And then, I, well, I've got a very important business meeting tomorrow. Oh, we could take care of that. But... I did talk my way out of it, with the exception that uh, the condition was this. I had to check in with my son's counselor every day. <laughs> this is where I'd come to. I, I had to check in with my son's counselor to convince her that I was, you know, living an appropriate life to allow him to live at the house. And one of the conditions was to do 90 meetings in 90 days and attend a certain amount of IOPs at Carrier or whatever it was. And I said, great, I'll do it because, you know, I didn't want to go to rehab. And um, I went reluctantly to 90 meetings in 90 days. I didn't like meetings. I was the last one in, the first one out. I didn't know any names. I didn't have a sponsor. A whole bit. Uh, and then I fell in with Chris through no plan of my own, okay? Uh, you know, and Chris has heard this story a million times, and probably Bill has too, but it went something like this. You know, I, I went into a meeting. Maybe it was kind of like this. Oh, well, it was much smaller, all right? And they were having a big book meeting. And uh, at the end of the meeting, I noticed that they'd hand out forms. Now, of course, I wasn't there when the forms were handed out because I came late. You know? <laughs> so um, afterwards, I said to Chris, uh, hey, could I see one of those forms? Now, he'd seen me around for a while. So he says, uh, looks at me, uh, sizes me up, and he goes, nope. <laughs> now, I knew this was going to be a bad conversation because he's a nice guy, right? And in an AA, you're supposed to help everybody, and you know, you're not supposed to say no and stuff. And, you know, so this was not going to be good, right? So I said, oh, okay, well, fine. And I'm trying to walk away, and he goes, but if you come to my house, I'll show you what the form is for, and maybe I can explain it to you. Because without an explanation, it's really not much help to you. So I'm, I'm arguing, I don't want to go, no thanks. And the guy I had taken to the meeting was a guy from the VA hospital I'd given a ride to. Now, for any of you who know the guys who get into the VA hospital as a, as in the homeless program, any trip out of the VA hospital is like the best thing in the world. So he, he was riding with me, and he heard that there's an opportunity to go to somebody's house on a Wednesday night. 
you know, maybe get coffee and cake and stuff, you know. And he goes, yeah, let's go, Ron. You could, you could drive me. And I go, I'm not driving you. I'm not even going. He goes, like, no, you got, please drive me. We'll both go together. And, um, and so I went. And um, I was a complete atheist. I was in this program so reluctantly, you don't even know. I mean, it was horrible. Um, I was more emotionally devastated than when I was drinking because I was getting clear on my harms. My harms were getting pretty obvious to me in terms of what I'd done to my family, uh, in terms of abuse, and uh, just a, a lot of things were weighing heavily on me. And so in my, I wasn't drinking, I was dry, but I wasn't uh, by any means happy. In fact, I was going to meetings at that point, and I remembered a couple of meetings, I'd raise my hand, and I'd just get started this year, and I'd just cry, you know, like, I don't know what happened to me, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. And, you know, I know, I know what was going on, because I've talked to people since then, they're going like, oh, shit, here's Ron, he's going to cry again, you know, he's the crier, he's back. Um, and so that's the condition I, I was at when I went to Chris's house. I went there a couple of times, I have no knowledge of what he told me, no knowledge. Um, I just was driving this guy there, going through the drill, going home, forget it. One night we went there, and I was in such pain, such desperation in terms of my low bottom, spiritual, emotional, physical place that I was in, that I had that moment of surrender people talk about, right? And in my case, what happened was I literally said to myself, I'm looking at Chris and I'm thinking, I'm going to do anything he says. Screw it. I'll do, I'll do anything he says. I don't care. My life is shot. I don't know where my life is going. My kids are, everything is out of control. My job, everything. I'll do anything he says. I'll just do what he says. And the reason I can remember it so clearly is because physically what happened was I picked up a pen or a pencil and started taking notes. There was a physical, emotional, mental surrender where I actually said, I'm going to really do what you say this time. What do you want me to do now? You want me to go home and do this? What section do you want me to read? I'm making notes. And I was physically engaged. You know, I had changed. There was like a, like a change. And I began to go through these steps. So within the first six months of my recovery, I had gone through um, a fifth and sixth step, with, uh, a fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth step with Chris. And by the end of my first year of recovery, I had completed all of the amends that I had known to me at that time, uh, which isn't to say I didn't create new ones, <laughs> but at that time I was, on my side of the street was clear. And the resulting uh, effect of that was that my life was changed um, dramatically. I had a spiritual awakening. I began to see life differently. I began to experience life differently. Um, I had a sense of a higher power in my life. I came in as an atheist, and I mean a hard atheist. I would talk to you about the absence of God in the world. I would argue with my, I always get around, I used to argue with my mother-in-law at Christmas about whether there was really a God, you know, in the kitchen while she's trying to make turkey, you know. And, uh, yeah, you're weak, you believe in God, Jesus Christ, at Christmas. And, um, and, you know, so here I am a year later, I, I have a sense of a spiritual, um, spiritual change in my life. I'm beginning to relate differently to my family, to people at work, to friends. Um, I'm having people ask me, what happened to you? <laughs> I had one guy came in my office, an associate, closed the door, and he says, hey, what happened to you? And, you know, I could tell by the way he was asking it, but he was saying parenthetically, what happened to you? You used to be an asshole, you know? Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I was having, I was having these changes. And... Um, and I began to really have a sense of where I belonged in the world, you know, because spiritually, you know, the definition of a spiritual awakening, as it's outlined on page 25, and actually that's a little bit of a lift from some things of, um, uh, that are some other spiritual texts, but it says that, there's, that the spiritual awakening is a change in perception in three levels, that your, your perception has changed with regards to how you see the world around you, it's changed in regards to how you see others. And it's changed in regards to your perception of how you relate to a higher power. So on page 25, it talks about changes, how we see things. It's not a bolt of lightning. It's just that I see things differently. The world looks different. Instead of being threatening, terrible, horrible, negative, it's positive. It's good. I'm blessed. 
I have gratitude. Instead of relating to other people on, on one basis, which is, <laughs> what can you do for me? <laughs> okay, That's the sole level of my relationship with others. It had become, what can I do for you? You know, what can I give? And uh, in terms of a higher power, I began to develop a sense of a higher, higher consciousness that I really felt deep within me and that I related to and that I felt I was drawing power from. So that was my experience in, in, in working these steps and in having um, that type of spiritual awakening. Today I sponsor eight guys right now. I'm always sponsoring around that many, give or take. And there are always a few of them going through the work, going through the steps. Um, I currently have a couple of guys in, in amends, and I think I'm done with any current fifth steps. But there's always some action in my life that relates to doing these steps um, with other people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fourth step. I'm a little bit forgetful. I've been a little out of, out of touch here for the last month. My, uh, my father was real sick and um, had the opportunity to spend time with him. Um, as he passed uh, just a couple weeks ago. And so I haven't been to meetings and I'm a little bit behind on my homework, but uh, I could tell you that it was, it was a really powerful experience and a good experience. So um, let me see if I can get into the fourth step. Mm -hmm. Before I do it, I want to say something that um, I want to make sure everyone understands clearly. I hope that everyone's come here tonight with, um, and remember, this is a set-aside prayer, so don't get all pissed off at me. Um, uh, I hope everyone's come here with what I'll call a healthy sense of agnosticism, okay? And I really believe that. I believe that coming to a meeting um, and coming into this process requires some agnosticism. And I'm going to help you with that by explaining what the word agnostic really means. It was actually coined in the late 1880s by a, a scientist slash philosopher named T.H. Huxley. So it's not an ancient word. Okay, It's a word that was really applied during the 1880s. And in the 30s, when the book was written, the word agnostic really had a totally different understanding in our culture. It was a word that was literally 50 years old and had a totally different meaning and I assure you, and almost anybody in this room um, understands. What Huxley said is, agnosticism doesn't mean you don't believe, and it doesn't mean you believe. It means you don't know. All right? But it also means you care, and you apply a rigorous discipline to understanding. All right? So when he applied it to spiritual principles and to God, it doesn't mean... I don't know if there's a God or not, and I don't care. I'm an agnostic. It means I really don't know, and I want to find out, and I want to search, and I want to know for myself if there's a higher power. I want that experience to be mine. And what Huxley actually said is you should be applying reason. This is a quote. Apply reason as far as it will go. Okay, And so for those of us in a spiritual journey, we're going to apply reason as far as it will go. But it ain't going to get you all the way there, right? Because you can't prove there's a God. At some point, that's, a, that's an inside job. You're going to have to develop that understanding yourself. So when I say you should be an agnostic as it relates to these steps is you don't need to believe in the big book. You don't need to believe in me. You don't need to believe in what I'm going to hand out. That's really a kind of absence of faith. All right? But what I would encourage you, and I'd like to ask you to consider is, try it. Do it. Experience. Have it be your own, you know? Don't listen to somebody tell you what a fourth step will do for you. Do one, you know? Don't imagine what a spiritual awakening would be because you read about it. Have it, all right? This is an experiential process. So when we come with a sense of agnosticism, it means I want to find out. I want to know. I want to be a part of this process, okay? And that's a little bit different way of, of thinking about it than simply saying, I'm going to take it on, 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 faith, on, on, uh, on um, faith. on faith. Um, so I'm going to hand these out. Maybe, Mike, you could help me a little bit. Mike. <laughs> if they go around... Since you've done such a good job of getting so many people here, I think you've outstripped my copy machine. Um, 
And I'm less concerned when it comes to a fourth step with what forms people use. All right? And there's a lot of them out there, and they're all good. That's my opinion. Now, they're all good. So if there's a set of forms, I know Bill has got uh, forms that he uses, and maybe Chris has got some, and I didn't bring any along tonight, but if you, if you don't have a four-step form, I'm sure during the course of this workshop someone will get some into your hands. My attitude is, I even tell sponsees, hey, you want to do a four-step with me when we get to it? Bring whatever forms along that you like, okay? Bring, bring the forms along. I'm not concerned with the mechanics of it, but I am concerned with what's on this page. This is an overview of what the fourth step includes, okay? Now, before I get there, there's one thing I want to read and I want to make a point of because I think it's really interesting and it's a compliment to um, Bill Wilson. And I don't know if it's been pointed out before, and if it has, then I apologize. Um, and maybe Chris will correct me on it. But in each of the steps, now, now one of the things is the, the big book isn't, isn't written with today's standards of sort of headings and subheadings and bullet points and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's not a PowerPoint presentation. But um, it has a lot of interesting um, logic to it and things in there that if, when people point them out to you, really provide interest to me anyway, and maybe will provide interest to you. Um, in the first three steps, Bill makes a point of, in a way, kind of foreshadowing or introducing the next step in the preceding step. So when you read in uh, more about alcoholism, um, he's at the end of that chapter, he goes into great detail about insanity. Because in the next chapter, we agnostics, he's going to talk about you know, higher power restoring us to sanity. But the sanity discussion takes place in we, we, um, more about alcoholism, really, okay? In step three, everything you need to know about step four is introduced, all right? And it's very, very powerful. So on page 62, within step three, uh, at the top of page 62, it says this. Are not most of us concerned with ourselves, our resentments, I'm going to get to that in the fourth step. Um, our self-pity. And then it says selfishness, self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. So it doesn't say, hey, one of the things that's going wrong is selfishness. It says it is the root of all our troubles. So if you want to go in the big book and look and say, so what's my big problem? It doesn't really say alcoholism. It says selfishness and self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, okay, our self-centered fear, um, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us, seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. That paragraph, which is... Before the third step prayer, before the third step promises, kind of buried back there in the early part of the third step, is the, is the introduction to the fourth step. It really tells you what's going to happen in the fourth step. Because in the fourth step, it's all about us, okay? When we get to the ninth step, it's going to be about others. But in the fourth step, it's about us. What do we really know about our own behavior? What do we really understand about the nature of our true self? I mean, I don't know about you, but me, it was not much, Okay? Uh, it was a lot of BS that I put on mask to tell you who I was, to show you who I was. But it wasn't who I really was. <clears throat> our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And so this introduction in the third step is sort of a way of preceding the fourth step. The third step concludes with asking God for help. But it's left us with this thought in the back of our heads that, wait a minute, you're telling me I'm causing these problems? How do, I, how do I address that? How do I solve that? Um, above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must or we, it kills us. And then it goes into some God discussions to really lead us into the third step. It says God makes this possible. But the preceding paragraph in third step on page 62 is basically your introduction to the fourth step. And what it's really saying is that self-centeredness is the root of all our troubles. And 
I'll tell you this. You can pick almost any religious text in the world, and I'll show you where it basically points that out. It's in Christianity, it's in Buddhism, it's in just everything that I can think of. It really talks about this whole nature of us primarily dealing with ourselves. All right? And the idea really is later we're going to find out that the more we can give, the more we empty of ourselves so that we're kind of an empty vessel for God, the more he can fill us up. (coughs) But we need to, first of all, we need to deal with how selfish we really are how selfish we really are. And so the fourth step is a tool to do that. And it's through the fourth step that we address um, the self-centeredness. And it's, it's throughout the, um, the inventory. So let's go to the page. The page says there's four parts. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, these, some of these for most of you are probably... Um, overkill, but we'll just go through them quickly. There's four parts. There's a resentment inventory, there's a fear inventory, sex harms inventory, and the one that often gets left out is a sex or relationship ideal. I know many people who just haven't done that, just hasn't been part of the process, but it's clearly outlined in a big book as the fourth element of inventory. Now, one of the things I want to point out, and the reason I've highlighted some sections on this page is I think it's easy for us to do the fourth step and approach it in a mechanical fashion, which means I've got to write. <laughs> Give me that goddamn pencil. I've got to write. Okay? Actually, it doesn't work like that. Most people say, oh, i got to write? <laughs> I don't want to write. Um, but they're thinking about writing. And, um, and that's what we have to do ultimately. You know, that's the mechanical part of it. Um, and they want to get the columns right, and they want to understand the definitions of the headings and that kind of stuff, and that is it's important. But the most important thing I want to tell you from my experience is that the fourth step is a spiritual experience. It's a spiritual experience. It's not an intellectual exercise, okay? My intellectual exercises is what got me drunk. We've heard that all the time, right? So I don't want to apply intellect into this inventory. What good is that going to do me? Right? So I need to make this a spiritual exercise. So how do I make it a spiritual exercise? The first thing I do in every example, in every part of the inventory, is I pray first for guidance. So, for example, when I'm doing my resentment inventory, you know what I tell sponsees, before you even sit down to really write, before you pick up the pencil, you pray for guidance. And it could be a simple prayer to whatever higher power you have, but you're asking that higher power in. You're asking that higher power, okay, I'm getting ready to make a list of all these people that are real jerks, you know. Please help me, Shelby. Show me the, the, the biggest asshole first, you know. Uh, you know, well, you know. No, what we're really trying to do is, God, please help me see the truth about the list I'm about to make. God, please help me understand why these people are on my list. God, please help me do the right thing. It doesn't have to be a complicated prayer. It's just like I just said. I just made that up. I'm just asking a higher power in. Just give me some guidance. Give me the strength. Give me the direction. Show me what I have to do. So you do that. And then the first thing you do is you make a list of everybody, every institution, every person, every um, principal that you have a resentment towards. Or what I actually tell people is a little bit different, you know, we have an interpretation of resentment, meaning a fierce anger towards somebody. Um, I really think a resentment can just be somebody who makes us uncomfortable. I am uncomfortable with that person. I am uncomfortable with that authority. I'm uncomfortable being told what to do. Okay? I'm, I'm really pissed off, but I feel better saying I'm uncomfortable. You know? um, so the uncomfortable part allows that list to change its shape and dynamic. Okay? Because when you say that, all of a sudden it says, well, who am I uncomfortable with? And if if you're uncomfortable with them, then you've already told yourself something that's pretty important. They're taking up space in your mind. Okay? Because anybody I'm uncomfortable with, I'm thinking about. Okay? Um, So we make the complete list. Then we complete the first three columns. Okay? Why we're we're angry, how it affects my pocketbook, my self-esteem, my uh, sex ideals, whatever those six questions are. Get the first three columns done. And again, before we go to the fourth column, this is the most important part of the resentment inventory as far as I'm concerned, is we stop and the directions from the big book say that we pray 
for every individual on our list. Okay? And the prayer is asking God to show us tolerance and to guide us towards, because that is a sick person too, how can I be helpful to that person? So I know why I'm angry at that person, and now I'm going to pray about that person, seeking knowledge of how I can be patient, tolerant, and helpful. And then I can fill out the fourth column and look for my dishonesty, my self-centeredness, and my fear. All right? But without that prayer, we're just moving right through. All right? So what I tell people is fill out all three columns, get them all done, for the whole inventory, then stop. Go back to the top of the list. You can do it one of two ways. Either you go down the list person by person by person by person and praying for each person. I've actually done it that way and it took me like an hour to complete all the prayers, even simple prayers about that person. Please help me show patience and tolerance towards this person. Please help me. And it can be a very powerful experience if you allow yourself to incorporate some meditation as part of that. Okay? Because you want to ask for patience, tolerance, and how you can be helpful. And then you want to provide some open space in your mind to seek what those answers might be. You know? Meditation is overlooked time and time again in this process. And um, if you look at the book carefully, it'll, give, it'll say, pray. And then it might have the word, considering how it can be helpful. Well, that consideration is a form of meditation. Or it may say something like, pausing or asking ourselves. Those are all different phrases to be used for a form of meditation. So if you go back and look big book, you will find got instructions for prayer and meditation at every part, every step along the way here. So we pray for each individual on our list, asking God to show us tolerance and guidance towards how we can be of help. And then we meditate, considering how we can be helpful to that individual. And then we complete the fourth column. All right? So you can see that it's both mechanical, you're going to write, but it's also very spiritual. I'm incorporating a higher power into this process. I'm incorporating prayer and meditation into how I approach what I write on paper. Fear inventory, the same thing. Before you start a fear inventory, praying first for guidance. God, help show me the truth about my fears. Help me not avoid the truth by leaving them off the list. Help me be honest and help me be complete. It can be a simple prayer. It's a simple request for that kind of spiritual guidance. Um, and then you complete whatever forms that you've used, used given to your spot by your sponsor, listing the fears, completing the second column, and again, utilizing prayer and meditation to consider the cause of our fears and asking God to remove them. There's actually instructions in the fear inventory that actually, that actually asks us to pray, meditate, and pray again. The prayer is, says God, uh, help show me about the truth about the prayer, the, the fears. The meditation is to consider the truth about those fears and to dig deeper into, well, if I'm really afraid uh, that someone's going to leave me, does that mean I'm really afraid of being alone? And if I'm really afraid of being alone, does that mean I feel that I'm separate from everybody, from maybe even a higher power? To dig deeper into what those fears really could be. And then to ask God to remove them. There's an instruction in there that our prayer is to ask God to remove those fears. Um, the sex harms inventory, same thing. Whatever form you've been given to, to use by your sponsor, great. I'm not, I'm not going to you know, go through the specific form. But the first thing you do before you pick the paper or the pen up is to pray first for guidance. Um, and then once you've completed the inventory, you pray for guidance and meditate on those harmed. And it actually instructions in there. It says, meditate on those harms and your pattern of conduct. So what are you going to learn in meditation about how you treat others? The sex harms inventory is meant to show us not only the harms we do, but the pattern, how we do them over and over again, especially to who's our favorite target in sex harms inventories? The people we love the most, okay? You'll find that over and over and over again, you know? For anyone who's married, you know, I don't want to get do this too deep, but you know, if your wife is, if, if you got a wife, she lives in the house with you, she's going to get a lot of crap, you know? And um, just because they're close to you, they're the people we live with, they're the people that we spend time with, and they're the people we often take um, for granted and are um, most likely to harm. And then the last uh, part of the fourth step is to do a sex relationship ideal. I call it, it's called a sex ideal in the big book. I really call, I always insist that it be defined as a sex relationship ideal. And the instructions in the big book are very uh, specific there as well. 
praying first for guidance, um, and meditating on the foundation and the characteristics you would look for in future relationships and your own willingness to love to these ideals. Think of it this way. You go through those first three sections and you find out everything about yourself which might not be so good. I mean, some of you might be really good, but I don't know. Um, you know, might not be so good. And you find out the truth. And now what are you going to do with it? One of the things you can do with it is you pray, you ask God, show me the truth about how I can treat people differently in the future. Show me the truth about how I can act in this world and be of a help to others. And then to write that down. And that will typically be the opposite of the way we've acted in the past. You know, I typically see in the relationship ideals things about mutual respect, being patient, being tolerant. You know, a little bit along the lines of, you know, the prayer to, you know, help others before we ask for help ourselves. So that's a paragraph form, and that defines a, um, a method of living. And it, it certainly is meant to be applied to our significant other. But if you read a, most relationship inventories, they can be applied to all relationships. You know, and it's, it, they tend to follow the Christian ethic of treat others the way you want to be treated yourself. You know, um, so that's the, the inventory. Um, let me take a few minutes to, to, to suggest to some people, or actually to give my own personal experience um, of what my inventories, were, 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 my first inventory was like. So maybe it can, it can um, um, make sense for those who haven't done it before. So I'll start with, and I've done some of these before, I'll start with something different. Um, I'll start with my employer, okay? So my employer, okay, my boss, he's not doing things right. He's taking the company down. You know what I mean? He's driving it into the ground. Um, if only he would do it my way, okay, everything would be great because I can clearly see where the growth opportunities are for this company. And um, um, the reason I'm so upset is he's not listening to me. He's not respectful of my ideas. He doesn't see my potential. He doesn't understand how much I can contribute. Um, those things which really aren't very self-centered in nature, um, but which are stuck in my head, right? It affects everything. It affects my pocketbook. It affects my sex ideals. It affects my self-esteem. Everything in that column is affected. This is what actually happened to me. I said a prayer. I asked for the truth about um, how I could be helpful to my boss and what my role in this relationship that was at that time really deteriorating. I was thinking about leaving the company. Um, he was thinking about firing me. It wasn't good. Um, so I get to the fourth column. So, first of all, am I honest? No. Have I always told him the truth? No. Have I talked behind his back? Absolutely. Have I discussed with other people how I feel about him when he's not there? Absolutely. All right. Do I have fear? Well, I didn't really think so. I had to meditate on that a little bit. And then I realized I had tremendous fear. Tremendous fear. And the primary fear was if he was right, as I thought about it, if he was right, then all along I've been wrong. Now, I don't want anybody to think I've been wrong. I'm afraid I'll look bad. I'm afraid I'll look stupid. I'm afraid he'll think I'm stupid. I'm afraid I don't even know how to do my job right. The only way I can do that is to convince other people that he doesn't know what he's doing. So I was doing that out of fear, self-centered fear. I wanted things my way. I wanted people to believe I was smart. And I was doing it at his expense because if I can convince you he's dumb, then by definition, maybe I'm smarter. All right? So I was dishonest. I was full of self-centered fear. And I was completely selfish because I wanted everything to be done my way, all right? When I saw that, I realized that I had done nothing to really contribute in a healthy way to the company, that I had done nothing to really do anything in a cooperative fashion, and that I was going to have to change the way I acted as an employee. Um, 
my kids. I, I, I usually tell this one because it's the most dramatic, I think, in some cases, but it's, it is the truthful. It's being truthful. So my kids, I'm mad at all my kids. I have resentment towards all of them because they've all, they all have very beautiful similarities, beautiful characteristics. They've all been arrested for drugs or alcohol at one time in their life, all three of them. Um, they've all had drunken driving charges and been to, to court. And mis- I, this, is, this is not something I'm proud of. It's just the truth. And um, they've cost me thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, they've either gotten thrown out of school at one time or another or flunked out of school, you know, um, and that's cost me money, you know, and um, I've had to discipline them. You know, my daughter at one point, who's in the program now, after her second DUI, and actually she's under house arrest at this moment, um, uh, at one point I had to carry her to a police station. Because the police said, if you bring her in, we won't come to the house and arrest her in handcuffs and drag her out of the house. You got like 15 minutes. I go in and said, you coming with me? And she said, no. And we got into a physical fight. I, she was 15. I won. Okay. Uh, um, and, um, and I had her over my shoulder in a fireman's carry, and I threw her in the car, and I got her to the police station, you know? And I should be mad at her, right? So then I took a good look at my inventory. I prayed for these three kids. I asked God to show me the truth about my role, my fears, my selfishness, my dishonesty. And the truth was, in all three cases, is my self-centeredness was, the biggest thing I had going against them was, they made me look bad. Okay? What do the neighbors think? It doesn't make me look like a very good dad. If they're all screwed up, I must not be doing a good job. Makes me look bad. The other thing I noticed in terms of my self-centeredness was they're costing me a lot of money. Okay? It's my money. I don't want to spend it on them for lawyers' charges and for rehabs and stuff. Um, And then I looked deeper into how honest I was, and, and the honest part was I began to realize that the truth was I had a fear that I wasn't a good parent. And the fear when I went deeper was I did not know how to be a good parent. And anyone who's parent knows that so if we don't know how, our best fake out face and mask to put on is be angry, okay? You know, tell them you got to do it my way because it sounds like you have a way, okay? You know, <laughs> you know if, if you do what I say, you're going to be okay. It makes it sound like you're an authority. Really, in the back of my mind, I had gotten married... Um, uh, at 21 and began having kids right away and I really all my life uh, when I did an inventory I realized I never felt I was a good husband I was afraid that I didn't know how to be a husband I was afraid I didn't know how to be a father and that my self-centeredness was really all about me and as I made this list it wasn't about gee I'm concerned about their future well-being you know or gee I really want them to be spiritually healthy in the future those thoughts never occurred to me it was they're costing me money. They're making me look bad. That was the truth. And wow, that's a kick in the head, okay, for anybody who's a parent, you know. That's, that's the truth. And I went through that inventory. I had similar experiences with my wife um, where I always wanted to be in charge because even when I thought she was being smart, I didn't want her to get up on me, so I had to act smarter, you know, not give her a chance. And... Um, and I was being completely self-centered in the relationship. Um, I was full of fear about not being a good husband. Um, and I was being dishonest a great deal of the time. So I continued to go through that resentment inventory. And the truth was, there were things about myself that I had never seen before. Now, that's just my experience. I'm not saying that's going to be yours. I would urge you agnostically to check it out for yourself. But you've got to dig deep. You've got to ask yourself the 12 tough questions. You know, am I re- willing to see that darker side of myself? Am I willing to see that shadow of a person who's really more concerned about himself, in my case, than his own children? All right? Um, I had to dig, dig deep to really, to really get there because on the surface, it was all bullshit. Okay? Believe me. The first things I wanted to write in that fourth column were, oh, you know, I was just looking out for their best interests. I'm worried about them. You know? But today I am. Today, I, today I, I am, um, but that really wasn't who I was at the time. Um, and my fears, I'm not going to tell you that because I think that 
that when you do a fear inventory, hopefully you'll all get to the same place. There's one place we all get to, and I want you to get there on your own. Um, I will tell you this, though. When I wrote my sex ideal, and Chris knows because I read it to him, and I read it to my wife, I, I, I honestly, after having spent days writing this inventory, and actually the way I did it, just so you know, was I put it off as long as I could. I kept stalling and stalling and stalling, saying I don't have time, so I don't have time. And then finally one weekend, my family went away on vacation without me, which at this time, you know, they were like, that's their best vacation. Um, and they left me at home, and I had no excuses, and I had two days to write this inventory. And I spent two days just writing, 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 and discovering these painful truths about myself. And then at the end, you know, I said, God, well, then show me how I should live. What's the way I should approach these relationships in the future? And what, was, what I wrote was something that it just did not, they were not words that I would typically use. They weren't phrases I would typically use. They just weren't, weren't the kind of person I was at the time because I was speaking about um, giving more love than I needed to get back and, 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 and looking at the other person with mutual respect and with dignity and honesty and being willing to look at the other person for who they were and to accept their point of view. God, accept my wife's point of view? Come on. Um, and I wrote this out. I'm looking at it. I'm saying, this, this is unbelievable. My wife kept it. It's the only part of the inventory that's still alive today, I'll tell you about that. You know, the rest of it's all gone. It's all thrown away. But that, that was saved, and she, she kept it someplace. Um, and today I can tell you that you know, as a result of that inventory, um, with regards to my wife and that ideal, um, the amends I made to her ultimately was a very straightforward amends. And I'll say this for the benefit of anybody who's in a relationship today. Um, I made amends to her for, for 27 years or whatever it was at the time, or 20-some-odd years, of um, putting her in a place of being less than, Okay? Your ideas aren't as good. Mine are better. You don't know how to take care of the kids. I'll tell you how to do it. Oh, you know, if you, I better do the finances. You know, I don't think you'll understand, okay? And treating someone with the lack of, of dignity and the lack of respect that they really need. And so my simple amends to my wife was, you know, I, I, I went through the, the amends process, explaining what my harms were and asking the three questions. But ultimately what I did was basically said, I've, I've allowed you to live a life where you felt less than. And she actually burst into tears and she said, actually what you did is you made me feel small. And um, we, can, we can abuse other people by making them feel small in a relationship. Um, now, unfortunately, she's really big. <laughs> um, I don't even have a checking account. She has all the checks, all the finances, everything. Um, we got that straightened out. And um, uh, I get an allowance. <laughs> hey, come on. Um, and, uh, and my kids get a real charge out of it because they'll say things like, Dad, you think you ever ran this house? Come on. Are, are you serious? How drunk were you? Um, you know. Um, so, um, so that whole process, the fourth step uncovers that stuff for us, which allows us to get to that place of an amends so that we can then move from that inside um, uh, job to relating to other people. Um, I'll say that I'm, um, I'm blessed to be here tonight, and I'm grateful that I was able to uh, be a part of this, this meeting. And um, hey, one last question, spiritual question. How many of you, don't, tell, don't say which one it is, how many of you know what phase of the moon we're in tonight? That's it? We're in a full moon, folks. When you go out there, it is luminous, okay? It is beautiful. You want to have a good experience tonight? Go out. The, moon, the, the night is clear. I drove all the way over here just, just checking out the moon, all right? You want to be spiritually alive? Check it out. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.